Good evening from Money Matters TV. I'm Paul Sloat with Green Drake Partners, and with me tonight is Brian Kohut from HJ Wealth Management. Good evening, Brian. Good to see you, Paul. So, market hit a new high today. It did, right. So, not you know, obviously we don't know when this is going to be aired, so not the time to market, but it'll be in 2014 when it's shown, and you know, we came off a really good year, and it seems like so far the market's continuing that, um, which is a good sign. I mean, you know, we had a really solid 2013. Um, I think the good thing I like, and probably you too, is there's still this wall worry out there. People are still kind of reluctant to believe this is, you know, even last year was good, that this is going to continue. So I think there's still a lot of people thinking this correction's happening. Um, and we'll see. We're kind of in earnings season, and so far so good, right? Well, the earnings so far have been good. Uh, we've had some pretty big companies like Bank of America report mm -hmm. very good earnings. And so the market seems to be doing well. Um, and the only thing that might hold the market back a little bit might be the valuation. But other than that, the fundamentals are pretty good. And as we all know, the correction will come. Yes. And it will come when no one is looking for yes, it. Yes, exactly. So, right. I mean, we've gone a long period without having a, a decent correction. So it'll happen. As we said, if we could time it, <laughs> we wouldn't be here. We'd be at a computer. But, uh, but that's really buying opportunities for people that may have missed this, you know, have sat it out. For, for the last couple of years, this may be a chance for them to get in if, if and when the correction comes. Yeah. Right, because the market, you know, based on everything out there, should still have another good year this year and maybe another good year next year, and a lot then will depend on the Fed. Right. Did you keep some powder dry in the fund for some buying opportunities, or are you all in right now? No, we have some dry powder, and we've actually, for the first time in the last few months, actually found some companies to short fundamentally. Is that right? And, uh, in fact, we had one of those companies report disappointing earnings today, and the stock was down 5%. So what's happening is for certain companies, they need to reinvest in their business. And when you reinvest in your business, it means you spend money. Right. So there are some companies that need to do that, which means the margins probably won't be as good as people expect. Right. That doesn't mean earnings won't go up. It just means they won't go up quite as fast as people think they will. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like a segment of market has got ahead of itself. You know, some of the high flyers like the Teslas, and um, and I know you tend to stay away from those types of companies. Well, they're they're not really in <laughs> so, our wheelhouse, yeah, but. Uh, Yes, things like Tesla or even Amazon right. trade at tremendous multiples, and it's really unclear whether ultimately they will earn enough money to justify right. those multiples. True, good point. So. <laughs> so, well, with the market doing well and the economy looking like it's going to pick up, what does that mean for interest rates? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've been saying this for a while. Interest rates have to go up, and that's still the case. They have to. They started, you know, coming up with, you know, we don't hear as much of this taper talk. It was every other day was taper. Are they going to do it? They started doing a little bit of it, and they're going to probably do more of it if they can. Um, and I think, you know, the 10-year Treasury is hovering around 3%. Rates are going to go up. I mean, they have to continue to go up. Um, which puts pressure on the bondholders, right? They weren't getting a whole lot of interest to begin with. Um, but, you know, I think we're all going to see the yield curve continue to go up, which is good for the banks, which is why the banks are probably having a, a good time right now. So um, so we'll see. It should be good for the saver in, in bank accounts, right, because hopefully eventually they'll get a better <laughs> return out of their They'll bank. actually get a return <laughs> yeah, on their investment. Exactly. So mm. what are you, are you doing anything for the impending rise in interest rates? Or? Uh, no, we have taken... Uh, a more conservative view with certain interest rate sensitive areas of the market, such mm -hmm. as utilities or REITs. REITs actually had a very bad year yeah. in 2013. They did. Yep. And most people don't realize, most people who held REITs, even with the good dividends, they lost money. Yeah. yeah. And in a market that was up right. 30%. Yeah, interest rates freaked out the REITs. So the interest right? rates really freaked out the REITs. Um, I think some of the select interest rate sensitive issues will be okay because they'll be able to raise dividends enough to offset the interest rate increase. But I think for the interest rate sensitives, it will be a problem. Yeah, I, know, I, I meant that as a, you know, so last year, it was primarily a U.S. dominated um, rally in the market. What, what do you see in Europe or more importantly, emerging markets were negative. You see that reversing or you still think U.S. is the, more, the place to be? Well, I think U.S. is still the place to be. I think Europe is turning a little bit, so it's going to get better. I think that Europe faces some medium to long-term issues is will the economy get 
better enough. And by that, I mean you've had this since countries like Italy entered the EU, right. you've had this massive difference in economic performance where before then they and Germany were basically in sync on economic right. performance. But once they entered the EU and were tethered to the euro and to the you know, policies run out of Brussels, for the overall EU, their economy has massively, massively underperformed. And in fact, their industrial production is back to levels not seen since the 1980s. Wow. So I think that the longer term issue is that if the EU as a whole doesn't follow economic policies that allow countries like Italy to grow at a reasonable rate, right. they're not going to stay part of the EU. Right, yeah. So while well, I think in the near term you have a cyclical recovery in Europe and you'll have certain sectors like some of the financials and some of the industrials where you can do well because they're going to be tied to overall not only European but global economic recovery. I think the intermediate term question is what happens to Europe starting later this decade if they don't have a robust recovery? You think the EU will get unwound in our lifetime? I think there's a reasonable possibility. Yeah, so that'll be interesting. <laughs> uh, you know, it'll be interesting. I never understood when they put it together. Right, yeah. But um, as to emerging markets, they are cheap statistically. I'm not quite sure if we're there yet. Right. but. For investors, it might be an area to what I would call tiptoe. Right. So you can tiptoe into the area and buy a little bit with the idea that you'll buy some more, maybe at a lower price, mm -hmm. but probably over the next six months is not a bad time to accumulate a position in the emerging markets, especially if the global economy gets going. Right. Yeah, I mean, the emerging markets seem to be tied to the same interest rate fear. When REITs got beat up, the emerging markets went down with it. So. Yeah, so it's interesting. So. Yeah, and if you were to look at the spreads, emerging markets are actually almost as cheap as they got relative to the developed markets as in 08 or back in the early 2000s. Oh, wow. So yeah. you're almost at the point where you just say the spread's so large, you're you just going to, you got to go, right. and then it will happen when it happens. Right. Yep. Good point. So. so speaking of the global economy, let's talk about commodities. Yeah, I guess there's a renaissance going on in the U.S. with commodities. I mean, you know, commodities another had a tough year, right? I mean, gold was negative, um, oil was flat to, to down, um, and I guess a lot of it are pinning it on the slowdown of China as part of the culprit. But you know, we're having a big, you know, natural gas renaissance here, so it's interesting. I mean, I think inflation eventually has to rear its head. I'm not sure, so sure it's anytime really soon, but eventually, I think inflation's coming and. Maybe commodities goes up with it. What's your what's your take on commodities? Yeah, well, I think you could get somewhat of a cyclical recovery if you know the global economy gets going this year, which we expect it to. So you should get some kind of bounce this year in industrial commodities, at least tied right. to the global economy. But we don't see any big rise in the commodities until inflation gets right. going. Right. And I don't think that that's a near term event. I think that's more a Seems like it's out of ways. Out of ways right? still. Yeah, right, so. I mean, there are like two and a half trillion in excess reserves in the banking system. Right. And if they get going, yeah, we can get some inflation, but I don't think they're going to get going yet. Yeah. Do you think natural gas is a game changer for the U.S., or is it more hype than, than reality? Well, I think it's uh, partially a game changer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the U.S. is on the path to energy independence. Most people don't know, but our net trade balance in overall <laughs> energy <laughs> right. is positive. Yeah, yeah. So we actually export some natural gas today. We also export NGLs, natural gas liquids, such as ethane, right. propane, butane. So when you, and we also export refined product. So when you take all those exports and offset them against the crude oil we import, we're actually net neutral to slight positive. Right. So I think over time, it's a huge positive for the U.S. to truly be energy independent. And I also think it's going to have big implications for our foreign policy. If we don't need to really import crude from the Middle East, do we need a big military presence in the Middle East? Right. Good point. So, so it may provide the U.S. an opportunity to think about what its longer-term strategic role is in the world and where it wants to deploy assets. Right. We we got a, a bad jobs number last you know last year I guess or last month last month um, 
was it an aberration or do you think there there's something to it yeah. I think it was an aberration mm -hmm. if you look at the ADP right, job yeah, numbers it was phenomenal it was yeah, fi right, fabulous yeah. over 200,000 right. jobs were created so I think that was an aberration the government's numbers have a tendency to be massively revised <laughs> and massively no, wrong in the no. short term. So I'll give you a perfect mm -hmm. example, non-residential commercial construction, okay? The government originally reported September and October as negative, mm -hmm. okay? Then when the November number came out, they revised the whole thing to positive for September, October, and November mm -hmm. such that the growth was double digits for those three months on an <laughs> annual basis. So when you look at government statistics, you really have to take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, I mean, you really, it's really gotta be a trend, right? Like not, you know, one month's data. It's doesn't not one give you month's a whole data. Lot of meaningful information. I, I mean, we, we follow things like the unemployment numbers week to week, right. and they can fluctuate <laughs> massively. Right. And so if you don't look at them in some kind of smooth fashion, yeah. It doesn't make any sense. I agree. Yeah. So yeah, it'll be interesting what happens next month because it'll probably be the opposite of what happened this yeah the past month. <laughs> it probably will be the opposite. <laughs> so. so, let's talk about China a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I guess we all knew it had to slow down. It's a pretty big country with a lot of people, right? So right. You can't grow double digits forever, right? So, um, yeah, you think the market's overreacting to the slowdown in China? Well. I would say yes and no. So I sound like an economist, right? Yeah, right As right. opposed to an investor, right? <laughs> so. Okay. So here's the the positive is that China is a big economy. It is going to grow, whether that number six and a half, seven percent, which are pretty 8%, good numbers, right? <laughs> they're really good numbers, and that's a lot of growth. Right. I think the negative is they're slowing. They have been investing a lot of money using debt. So if you look at their debt to GDP right. ratios, they've gone way up. Right. So, and the Central Bank of China is squeezing credit a bit. So what you could have is some kind of accident in the credit markets, mm. or you could have some large write-offs of loans in China. So there could be a problem there. And I think what everyone's looking at is the amount of debt that's been added to the system over the last few years. Right which is different than what happened in the really up until the recession. Up until then, they were growing the economy really with equity. Right. Why are they doing that? It's just cheap. It's so cheap right no, now? No, because the fundamental growth of the economy has slowed. Yeah, They've right. lost low labor jobs. Yeah, because they're getting a middle class now. Right? They're getting yeah. a middle class. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is, if you look at some of the investments, and, and we've talked about this, um, nickel, they're investing in, in nickel plants, which are uneconomic. They've built, they're building ethylene plants where they have no competitive advantage. In fact, it'll cost them at least twice as much, if not three times mm -hmm. as much, to produce a pound of ethylene. Mm -hmm. um, they are now, according to data we've seen recently, selling cranes in the U.S. at double-digit discounts to <laughs> establish players to gain share, yeah. but the Global leaders in that business who, let's say, have 20, 25% global share only have, let's say, 5% operating margin. So if you're selling at, right. let's say, a 15 or 20% discount to gain right. share and to get people to shift to you, it means you're losing money on every, right. every you know, uh, piece of equipment you're selling. So I think part of the issue is the economics aren't there for many of the investments. And in order to, China is a command economy. Right. So the government has said we're going to continue to grow, so the way to grow now is through the banks because profits have gotten squeezed and people can't self-fund. Right. So. so I think that's what, so are there real problems in the economy? Yes, but I think they'll still be able to grow, not as fast, and I think so there's, you've got this tension. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see it'll how it plays out. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. So I think that's a good point to pause and ask our question from our viewers. And our question today comes from Jack Thomas in Hatboro. And what Jack wants to know is, if I sell bonds because of the increase in interest rates, what's a good income strategy for the next investment? Uh, good question. You know, one we talked about before, and, and you know, I just, I would guess I would caution Jack and any viewer that's selling bonds because interest rates are going up, 
just to be mindful why you're selling the bond, what was the, the fundamental reason, and just um, if you're going for yield and you get a high yield, there's risk to it. So risk and return are attached at the hip. So just, just you know, understand your investment horizon. Um, people like the master limited partnerships for income. Um, people like um, you know, the REITs. REITs. Um, so there's a lot of things, but I'd say you could look at some of the equities, which are phenomenal, AT&T, Verizon. I mean, there's some phenomenal yields. That's how I'd play the income, but you got to weather the volatility of the stock. So, so it's, you know, unfortunately, it's all about your time horizon. How long are you holding the investment, and what's the appropriate risk you're willing to take for that return? So. Well, I think that's a great answer, Brian. And if you'd like to see a question asked on the show, please write to Money Matters TV, 205 East Levering Mill Road, Ballakinwood, PA, 19004, or email us at moneymatterstv at gmail.com. And now it's time for our guest, and tonight we have a special guest, Mr. Jules Sessions from Markham LLP. Good evening, Jules. Good evening. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing over at Markham, a little bit about who Markham is, and, you know, so the audience has a sense of who you are. Thank you. Uh, Markham is one of the largest accounting assurance and advisory services companies in the United States. Uh, it competes with the final four, as I affectionately call them, <laughs> uh, and the middle tier. And its marketplace is the middle market, entrepreneurial companies as such. Uh, the entire professional services uh, segment has been under attack because of the commoditization of their services. One of the things we've utilized over at Markham is a means of helping our present clients and gaining new clients through the R&D tax credit. And basically what I do for them is I have developed a business system, a marketing system, and an infrastructure in support of securing business utilizing the R&D tax credit as its basis. For, for, those, for those that don't know, so R&D, research and development, what, is, what exactly is that tax credit? Okay, in its, its most simplistic term, it's a tax advantage strategy. It's um, probably one of the best kept secrets in the United States, <laughs> being underutilized and unused. There are tremendous misnomers as to what it's all about, but it is a 30 plus year old government incentive program which is meant to keep research, development, and the word experimentation here in the U.S. Uh, a positive study will allow you to recoup federal dollars uh, that you've already paid or are about to pay uh, for qualified research expenditures. And those are things like uh, wages, contract research, uh, supplies, computer rentals, and such. And these are credits as opposed to deductions vis-a-vis -a, -vis a dollar for dollar deference of your taxes. The, the keys to the castle here are very interesting. Uh, there's no one package that fits everybody. The ideal user of this is a obviously profitable company that's going and growing. In the second position it would be a company that is growing but still might have some NOLs left and is profitable. And low on the totem pole is the company that's a startup. Now, that's not to say that the second and third positions should not consider the R&D tax credit. It's the kind of credit and the kind of incentive program that allows you to almost store and forward your credit. It has a 20-year carry forward if you do not utilize the credit in a particular tax year. It's also a function of your organizational structure. Uh, in a pass-through entity, an LLC, an LLP, an S-Corp, we're able to go back three years and recoup your tax credits, bring them forward, your option as to whether or not you want to open up those tax years to take them and utilize them, but we form a basis to go forward. Um, it also has a play at the state level. So this is not just a federal program. The, the state, for instance, Pennsylvania, has a very interesting way of dealing with their tax credit. They'll take your R&D uh, request at the federal level and they'll put it into a pool that the government in Pennsylvania has allocated for the year and as a function of how much you overrun the max that they allocated, you'll get a pro rata share 
of that pool based on your federal submission. One of the other subtleties is the concept of intellectual property, which is obviously one of the hottest areas that we're dealing with right now in our environment. Um, the government knows on a de facto basis that you had to have conducted research, development, and experimentation to have either a patent pending or a patent issue. Vis-a-vis, uh, anybody who has that type of situation is a prime candidate to file for the credit. And uh, we found that to be a very interesting tool to utilize with our association with a number of law firms. Right. This is client relationship material to the nth degree. It allows us to go in to the law firm, tell them that we have this capability, they're able to go back, and I hopefully not going to get accused of blasphemy here, <laughs> but instead of kachinging while they're sitting in front of their client, they can give them an, oh, by the way, we think that we have something that's going to put some money in your pocket because really what we do, the results of this increase the cash or cash flow position of a company. Right. It also has a very subtle utilization in the M&A area. It's truly a hidden asset. If theoretically you're the seller in a company and you've never conducted one of these studies, you can, and the cash increases your valuation. If you're the buyer on the other hand and the company you're acquiring has not taken advantage of the R&D tax credit studies, and you do, that's uh, going to lessen your, your purchase price. So there's kind of a, a unique way that people are able to utilize this credit. One of the misnomers is, hey, you know, I already expensed this, uh, I've capitalized it. The fact of the matter is the R&D tax credit is a second bite of the apple. It's, so you mean we could actually deduct the same expense twice? Well, I wouldn't go <laughs> put it in, in, in that form, but... Uh, that sounds like a tax shelter. <laughs> it, well, no, it's a tax advantage strategy. <laughs> now, it comes into play when your NOLs are exhausted. There are companies, like I said before, that will store and forward them. In other words, if you're not quite ready, the way the studies are conducted, uh, we would go in and we would interview and document on a very granular level to what the projects were that you worked on, and we document it, we pr produce a document that sits in your drawer if, in case a taxing agency ever wanted to know what the basis of this was. Um, the fact of the matter is, it's the government incentive program. And that's why I said people don't recognize that they're available credits, that they're just not taking advantage. It's underutilized, unused. Uh, everybody thinks it's high tech not high tech. The largest, the largest utilizers of this are the manufacturing segment. Um, you don't have to be successful when you do your experimentation. And it's not just research, hmm. development, and experimentation. It also includes your processes to do things, your methodologies. Uh, case in point, we do a marketing research company. You would never think that they would qualify for this. But the fact of the matter is, the concepts of big data and advanced analytics, writing the algorithms to do all this, to put your studies together, are all qualifying expenses that are included in this. Contract electronic manufacturing. When we went to sell the first one, the guy says to me, we don't own the product. I said, I know, but you own the process to put the boards together, and you own the process on how to put the lines together to produce the product. And the fact of the matter is, you're experimenting, not everything's right the first time, and that is what is considered a qualified research expenditure. And uh, it, it's just more and more people that we talk to go, oh, I never thought that we would qualify. And that's probably um, the basic response you get from most folks. Uh, frankly, when I talk to people, either they know about it, or I get what I classically call the Bambi in the headlights mm -hmm. look like. Come on, guys. <laughs> what are you talking about here? So, Is there a typical profile of a company that you know is a good fit for this R&D credit? Or? Well, the, the, the idea of being profitable, it, obviously it offsets profits. If you're not, you're not going to be able to You don't have any tax. Nah, you, you don't, don't have any tax. No, but <laughs> but there, there are companies um, that will do it now in anticipation of being responsible for taxes. As I said, you can store and forward this 
up to 20 years. Is there a revenue target that you say if you don't make at least X dollars of revenue, you, the credit doesn't even make sense to no. think about? Or no, no. It, it, it truly doesn't work like that. Um, it's a function of your profitability. Obviously, the smaller profits and the smaller companies, the smaller the credit. Uh, I've seen them range from $40,000 to a couple, two, three million dollars and higher. Are there, so if I'm a company, I do all this research and development to bring my, pro, my manufacturing product to market. Are there any limitations on how much I can take of this in any given year? Or can I, or is it just up to 100% of the amount? It's up to 100% of the amount, but it's really a function of your profits. Obviously, you can't take more than more your profits. More than profits, right. But the fact of the matter is, depends on where you are, where you are in your life cycle, your product cycles. The answer is, it's full bore. And as I said before, if you don't utilize it all in one year, you carry it forward to the next year. So it's it doesn't go away, and you come back on a year in and year out basis. It's, it's one of these concepts that's additive to the extent that uh, when you go out and start these studies, you have a base that you create depending on which method you use, and I don't want to get too technical mm -hmm. about that. Um, and what we look for is an increase over year per year in the size of your research and development expenditures and your staffing. Wages are the prime driver, the people that do this. The interviewing process is meant to pull out from them the percentage of their time that they deal with this. And that is all additive uh, in a cumulative sense to create a major portion of the R&D credit calculation is all about. So, so do you think a lot of companies are leaving money on the table because they don't think about this or have never heard of it or think they I don't think qualify? It's, it's, I, th I think that the last answer is probably the most dominant answer as to why they don't do it. They think we don't qualify. It's fascinating that they do, but they just don't recognize it. And uh, frankly, it's a, a great opportunity for someone like myself to go out there and open up the door and uh, create a new client for Markham. And this is exactly... Uh, the premise that I'd want the market with. So this applies to small companies, big companies. Manufacturing and technology, I would think, would be a no-brainer. To what extent can this be used in, let's say, the service industry? Yeah, we want to use it. If, let's say, we <laughs> want to use it. I mean, for example, a firm like ours does a lot of research. Is that research then? Market research is not a qualifying research event. Ah. Okay. The, the research and development credit has a four-part test to it. It has to be technological in nature. Okay. Engineering, biology, computer, physical science is something that goes along those lines. Uh, there needs to be technical uncertainty as to what's going to go on there. Um, it has to have a purpose. You're going to improve a product or you're going to create a product. Um, and you have a process of experimentation that you have to deal with. So that before you get to market, you're gonna be trying to do a lot of different things with your capabilities. It's, uh, and if you pass those tests, you're in. Regardless of industry, size, profitability obviously is the bottom line, no profits. You know, you wanna think twice about it <laughs> unless you wanna store and forward and you, look, there are companies out there, frankly, that are startups or they're emerging companies, I wouldn't say startups, but emerging companies that are just about to break out and they're going to have banner years projected in the future, it pays them to do that now because you can bring everything from the rear end up. As I said, a pass-through entity allows you to open up three tax years. A C-Corp allows you to go all the way back to the inception of the company as a function of how good your record keeping is. And that's why we suggest you do it in a current year where people's recollection and the documentation is more relevant. But if you have great records, all the way to you. Unfortunately, we're going to have to cut off the discussion because we're out of time. But that was a fascinating discussion. I want to thank you, Jules. Thank you. Next week, our guest is Janes Hollinsworth of Militia Hill Ventures. She is the general partner of the, her venture capital firm, which specializes in biotechnology companies. And from all of us here at Money Matters TV, your money matters. Thank you.